Uh, we're in Colossians, I think. Sound reasonable? Uh, got to get to the, the meat of the lesson. Get to, so just got to say, we've been working a long time on the prayer. Uh, prayer report to Thanksgiving. Uh, we worked for a number of weeks on verses 9 through 14. Um, the English text that we have um, breaks it up into several sentences. Uh, in the Greek text, it appears to be all one long sentence. And that one long sentence in the Greek text goes uh, at least to verse eight, uh, 17 and maybe through verse 20. Uh, so this is all one kind of long combination. So where we're headed just now it is a part of the prayer still. Um, the um, prayer had started with kind of the, the needs and what Paul wanted to happen in the lives of the Colossians, that they would be filled with knowledge. Uh, then it moved around verse 13, the end of 12, 12 and 13, to God the Father who had made them sufficient or had enabled them or prepared them, lots of translations of the word, <coughs> for uh, um, to sharing in the inheritance of the saints. And it talks about God in 13 and 14, brings in Christ. A and then verses 15 following start with a uh, description of Christ. Uh, Form-wise, or grammatically-wise, still part of the prayer. Uh, but these next six verses, 15 to 20, uh, a, a large number of New Testament scholars now believe uh, in part or whole uh, were part of an early Christian hymn that Paul quotes now in uh, this, uh, hoping that uh, e either he's teaching them new music or uh, he, he thinks maybe they've already sung this and it would be a way of connecting to them. Remember this is a church that he has not planted and uh, as near as we can tell has not been to yet. And, and so this would be I think in his mind a point of significant connection. Uh, the Greek text starts with just a relative pronoun. Uh, verse 14, transfer us into the kingdom of his son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. And then verse 15, who, Christ, the son, who is. And so let's read together uh, verses 15 to 20, and then we'll um, work on this marvelous text, okay? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Yeah. There's a few good phrases in here, I think. Um, uh, if you don't know this, I'll, I'll tell you again. Um, there aren't very many things scholars agree on completely. Uh, Everybody has to make their own niche by saying, you know, I think they're wrong and this is what's right. But in general, <laughs> in general, uh, verses 9, uh, sorry, uh, 15 to 17 form a, what we would call a stanza, and 18 to 20 form a stanza. Or uh, we might call it verses in the way we talk about hymns. Um, so below on the bottom of that page, I've tried to try to put the same words more or less in, diff not in uh, just running form, but more or less in the way a hymn layout might have been. Um, so as you look at those two stanzas, uh, first question, uh, 15 to 17 and then 18 to 20, what's the focus of each one of those? Christ is, in a sense, the focus in both. Christ and what in the first stanza? 
Christ in creation or Christ in the cosmos? Christ and everything. In the second one, what's the focus? The church. The church. Um, so, Christ. <laughs> uh, I don't know when I want to talk about this. Um, it, it just strikes me as pretty important that if this was a, a hymn that was sung in the early church, um, how deep is the theology of this? Pretty deep. Yeah. Which says, I think, um, we probably need to give attention to the depth of the theology of what we sing. Um, I don't think it's a direct quote, I think it's a paraphrase, but John Wesley said, the hymn book is the theology text of the laity. So if we sing shallow songs, what will happen to our theology <coughs> over time? It will become shallow regardless of what happens in the preaching and the teaching, the discipleship and the other kinds of things. Uh, if we sing theology that is, that is profound and deep, uh, it will create depth in us uh, in, in ways that we don't quite recognize and aren't always quite aware of. Um, singing, and, and I know this is true for uh, those of us who like to sing and enjoy it. I think it's true for most people though. Uh, it, it sticks stuff in your mind. Mm -hmm. yes. It puts it's things in your memory. Like um, and, and it's, I mean, <coughs> I, I started to get tired of myself on Thursday this week singing lines out of the choir special we're going to sing during the offertory today. It's and you'll it'll, it should be fixed in your mind because it repeats certain <laughs> phrases about a thousand times, <laughs> uh, which um, I, I don't always enjoy. But uh, and it's going so fast I have to work really hard to keep my mouth moving to keep up with all the words. But just from practice on Wednesday night, mm -hmm. and we practiced it some in the past, but it was just ringing away in my mind. Um, and so uh, the importance of the things we sing and to sing stuff like this. Um, now, I, I suspect there's also some issues that Paul picks this particular song. Uh, that perhaps there are issues at the church at Colossae that he thinks need to be addressed. So let's look at some of the individual lines. Um, he is the image of the invisible God. What does it mean to describe Christ as the image of God? That's what I've been wondering. What do we look at? Do we look at the last three years of his life and what he did as a man? Uh, do we look at his spirit? What, what image? What am I supposed to see? When, what am I supposed to see about God when I think about Jesus' life on earth? You might want to help Rick out. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, we need to include some things and exclude other things. Um, I suspect it's everything that we know about him, um, which includes what we learn from the Gospels about his ministry. Uh, it includes also what we learn from a couple of Gospels about his birth. Uh, there are issues... <coughs> Uh, defining his identity in the, the story of his birth. Uh, we sometimes are more interested in the uh, wise men and the shepherds and uh, Christmas pageants have kind of generated our, our, our Christmas interest. But um, if you think in both in Matthew, the angel's message to Joseph and in Luke, the angel's message to Mary, uh, identity of who he is and what he will do is given there. And, and so even there, there's stuff that he is imaging uh, God for us. Uh, and the fourth gospel doesn't start with his birth. It starts where? Yeah. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, I, I'm fairly certain I've told you this before, but I'll tell you again. Um, one, one of my memories from Willard Taylor, whom some of you know, remember, who was the dean of the seminary when I was a student there. Uh, he said, um, uh, it's as if he, he thought that Mark, and I agree, that Mark was the first gospel written and Mark has nothing about Jesus' birth. Mm -hmm. It just starts with John the Baptist's ministry. And, and Willard said, um, he says, it looks like um, as people read the Gospel of Mark and it circulated and its message was preached and it was recited by memory, which would have been the case in some churches, um, people began to say, someone as great as he must have had an unusual birth. I wonder what it was like. So Matthew and Luke, which come next, answer that question, what it is like. And, and he says, when Matthew and Luke are written and begin to circulate, people must say, oh, surely there's a connection even beyond that. And so John's gospel comes in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So, so that's a part of what we look to. Um, I, I think for us, we look to passages like this one too. Um, but... Uh, I image, you, uh, you said, what, what do I look at? So image is something that we see. What do images do? They clarify things. They clarify okay. Mind. Clarify. Certainly literary images are hopefully clarifying. Okay. It gives, us, it gives us ideas about the reality behind it. Okay. I put Jess's and yours. It represents reality. Um, in fact, in the uh, Greco-Roman world, this, a, a, an image was understood to somehow bring to reality what it was imaging. So that uh, uh, we are, uh, I think, justly critical of idols. But in that culture, a, an idol was not understood simply as a piece of stone or wood. It was something that brought into reality it represented in a real way uh, what that deity or God or goddess w was. Um, and, and so to describe Jesus uh, Christ as the image of God is to say the reality of God is now tangible for us. It's here for us. Okay. Um, anything else about image of God? Jess? Yeah, I the arrogance that we sometimes bring to trying to decide how Christ uh, represents God because we think we know God well enough that we can bring a judgment as to whether or not Jesus is God's son this takes the exact reverse of that we only know God well when we see him in Christ Christ is full representation of all that God is. And uh, we're not yet ready to hear it any more than the first century church was when Paul was writing this. And was contending with the Pharisees who had their own idea of what God should be and couldn't see Christ because of it. Uh, part of what you've said is, our, is in verse 19, in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Uh, <clears throat> and there'll be another statement in chapter 2 that reinforces that. Um, and, and a part of what happens with us, I think, if we're open to this, is we keep discovering more. Um, that we think we have God. We understand Him because we have these descriptors. Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, uh, love, holy, you know, the, uh, the attributes of God that you study in systematic theology. Um, and, and the danger of those things, uh, extremely valuable, the danger of them is that you feel if you know all of those, you have all the list. If you make an A in, in systematic theology from Tom Noble, <coughs> you feel like, man, I know this. This is what God is. <laughs> This is the box we put God in. Uh, to use Paul's phrase in 1 Corinthians, that we see through a glass darkly. A and every now and then we catch glimpses of something a little bit more. 
or of things that aren't systematic that God is bigger than our logic. Yeah. And it's through Christ, though, that we normally discover those sorts of things. Yeah. And image of God. I'm looking for you to recognize that phrase. Where does that phrase first occur in Scripture? In Genesis, describing whom? Humanity. Yeah, humanity. So that this is one of those fascinating phrases, the image of the invisible God. Is it talking about the deity of Christ? Well, we've been talking like it has been for a little while. Is it talking about the humanity of Christ? It certainly should fit that because that's the exact phrase that we use to describe the human creation in Genesis 1. And in that sense, that phrase turns its face in two differing directions, we would say, opposite directions, the humanity and the deity of Christ. Although I might say it's more a definition of what humanity ought to be, what humanity was created to be, than uh, what we've turned out to be. And it's, if, I think I can say this, I'm gonna. I think humanity in the image of God is the way God wants to see us and, and continues to think about us, which, uh, <coughs> I don't know uh, if this, this happens in your lives. Um, when somebody that I have respect for says something nice or nicer about me than I think about me, uh, maybe it's because of my respect for them. I don't just say, well, you're a liar. <laughs> uh, sometimes I do. Uh, but <laughs> I, I find myself wanting to live up to their expectations. And I, I think God sort of puts that first pitch in Genesis 1 to s set the expectations for us that he'd like for us to live up to. We're the image of God. But uh, Paul uses that here. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now, what's the point of invisible? He is spirit. Okay. Right culture where the images of the body are Okay. I'd say it speaks to me that he cannot be understood completely through human senses. Okay. Understanding has to go beyond our humanity. Okay. Uh, I, 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 when I read it, I thought the fact that God is a spirit and we cannot see him, we need Christ because we need an image. We need to see a visible sign of what Jesus <coughs> God is real like. And I believe that's one reason why he came is to show us the Father, to show us what God is like. And we have a hard time sometimes putting our image of Christ with, with God <coughs> and things that are the same thing. I can't remember the two things I wanted to say as you were talking. <coughs> um, one of the commentators that I read last night said, uh, in invisible is not a description so much of what God is essentially as it's our capacity to see. Invisible to us anyway. Whether he's visible or not. We don't. Because, this is the other thing, <coughs> <laughs> What's, what's an image of something invisible? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but don't try to go create one. Except God already has. Yeah. <coughs> Christ or humanity or Christ as the, uh, I call it the, the, the template for us. Yeah. yeah, first Adam, second Adam. Okay. Roger, mm -hmm. let's all go back here to verse 9 about uh, asking that God will fill you with knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That there's a whole lot to learn. And we have to keep on learning, keep on seeing new things. Yeah. We don't arrive. 
Um, <clears throat> one of the um, bad things I've done on this sabbatical is I've read some cowboy romance novels. <laughs> 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 and, and one of the characteristic things that happens in uh, at least some of the authors, they'll say about, uh, it, it's usually the man <laughs> thinking, uh, I, I, I want to spend my lifetime with this person. Mm -hmm. I, I think every day I'll be discovering something new about this person. Mm -hmm. And we think and say those things, at least before we get married, <laughs> in human relationships. Uh, but it's different. We don't often think that about God. And, uh, and we don't often keep that sense, I'm, I'll call it the sense of romance with God, that expecting that newness. And we talked about that in the previous weeks a little bit, that there's, it's always a growing knowledge. It's never, even though we use the word full knowledge for epigenosis, it, it's full knowledge that gets fuller and fuller and fuller. Yeah, okay? Yeah. Well, next phrase. I don't know what's become of this. Um, firstborn of all creation. The word firstborn occurs in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, some 130 times. In a number of passages, and I've given you just two, Exodus 13, two, Numbers uh, 8, 16, and both of those, and there's a whole host of these, that are talking about the sacrifice, the sacrificial animal is to be the firstborn. And, and uh, it, it appears to have a, just a chronological sense, the, the first offspring to be born. Uh, so it has birth in mind and uh, chronological order in mind, and it's firstness. But there's some other texts, uh, Psalm 80, 89, 27, uh, Sirach 36, 11, uh, in which the sense of physical birth, birthness, <laughs> and temporal priority aren't apparently in the picture. Uh, the word seems to describe a person having preference or predominance. Um, I, I sometimes contrast the two usages as the chronological usage and the uh, honorific usage. Because in that culture, a firstborn always had a certain status or uh, honor. And um, so uh, to say firstborn uh, it includes at least that sense of above all others. Uh, and it may or may not include uh, having been birthed and the firstness of it as part of the emphasis. Um, Marcus Bart, uh, who's the son of Karl Bart, and has written several commentaries on, uh, well, on Ephesians and Colossians. He says the concept then carries the meaning of chosen or beloved. Now, what's at stake in Christology, depending on which meaning we understand here, to describe Jesus as firstborn of all creation? He's the firstborn, and then there'll be others born. Okay. If he was born, then there was a time he wasn't. Okay. In a certain sense, maybe not a certain sense, just the way it is, uh, to, to say that another way, uh, he's not co-eternal with the Father. A and the deity of Christ is in some way lessened compared to being co-eternal with the Father. Um, now, because this verse is here, this is a verse that was used in support of uh, early Christian heresies that argued that Christ was not co-eternal with the Father, but was the first created thing, or the first created one. And eventually the church came to decide that couldn't be the case because of what we know from other verses and, and all. But it, it is, a, a, at one sense, a challenge to that. But it suggests, to me at least, that, okay, then maybe I need to look at the honorific understanding here. Uh, this word will appear twice in this uh, paragraph in this hymn. Yeah. Uh, so what's the significance of connecting Christ as firstborn or beloved or honored or chosen, the highest honor uh, of all creation? Uh, 
What is, what is the hymn trying to do with creation in Christ at this point? It's a primary responsibility of a Christian is to try to fathom who Christ is. Okay. So I think it's about as essential as you can get. Okay. It, it puts him above everything that we can know and perceive touch, feel, see, puts him above all of that. Okay. Mark? It does two things. It does elevate him in that honorific sense where he is above and beyond and in a system where the firstborn inherited everything, he would eventually be in charge or would be in charge. But by being firstborn, it also helps him to identify with those of us who are also partake in the image of God, um, even though it's been flawed. Okay. If I can reframe what you said, and you may not like my reframing, <laughs> it, it both separates Christ in creation yeah. and connects Christ in yes. creation. Yes, yes. That's so much better than what I said. No, it's just a different way of uh, <laughs> saying it. Jess? Well, the whole idea that firstborn for in him all things were created. So there, at that point, he becomes that predominant one, the source of everything, and yet a part of everything, which is so hard for us to get our minds right, because he's both source and participant. Yeah. The, the, the chronological meaning ha has, is challenged, at least, mm -hmm by verse 16, in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. All things. That would mean there wouldn't be anything that was not created by him, so if he can't be the first created thing uh, in that the tension between those two. In what you said almost with contradiction with things when you say Yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any problems suggesting that I don't think Christ was created. We're, we're sons of God by creation. Okay. He's sons of God by his own words. The only, the only begotten son of God. So there's a difference between begotten and created. Okay. Uh, Which leads me to another question I want your point of view on. When you try to get your mind around this, you end up saying human mind can't get there by logic. And the only way to accept it is by faith. Or are you satisfied that we can logically conclude, as they did in the Council of Nicaea, that no question here? That what? There's no question here. They decided it's all settled. Well, um, I'm not sure which box I want to be put in. When you're buried. First of all, I, I think I've made a commitment when I joined the Church of the Nazarene <laughs> that, that I would be willing to say that what Nicaea said, I will accept, and that's removed the questions. The Secondly, have, the laymen's have to believe that too. Pardon? The laymen's have to believe that too. O only if you want to be a member of the church. <laughs> now, having said that, uh, I also know, uh, now I get in good trouble with a retired general superintendent here. Um, <laughs> So the Church of Nazarene does have a procedure by which uh, all of its statements of faith, its articles of faith, can be amended and changed. Uh, so, so that must mean uh, there would be a procedure that if I felt like I didn't want to live with Nicaea anymore, I could uh, find somebody, I don't know if I could, I've never had any luck in this in the past, find some, some entity that would submit a resolution to change that and it would go through discussion and having observed some General Assemblies, that's even more terrifying than living with what we've got. Um, 
Um, so, so, but there's, so there's a part of me that thinks that this will always be a kind of something up there jerking on my thinking. Uh, not quite happy to say, oh, whatever Nicaea says is fine, or whatever the Articles of Faith says are fine. I, I've got to find scripture in this. A and uh, in terms of, and uh, I mean, I'm not one, I think some of you know, that to worry that scripture can't ever contradict itself, but I, I think it needs to be interpreted in ways that are coherent. Uh, and so I, I take uh, more scriptures that suggest the co-eternality of, of Jesus with the Father than I do these. Yeah, and I just got suckered in there going way past time here. Sorry. Our clock is slow, sorry. <laughs> Not very slow. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll start with verse 21 next time. No, we'll start somewhere in 16. Next yeah, time. 16 is <laughs> what I say. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you that you are bigger than us. Keep stretching us. We will submit to it uh, with joy and humility. Uh, and we pray that even in the service that follows, that you will stretch us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.